Hi everyone. This is going to be a walkthrough of the sheep brain for Bio 137. And uh, this is one of the tougher things that we learned this semester because uh, where this is an actual specimen as opposed to a model, everything is kind of the same color and kind of blends together. And there's only going to be a few features that really stand out. Um, so when we get to some of the dissected images coming up, pay very close attention to what I'm pointing at with the laser pointer. That way you know exactly what structures I'm pointing to. So first, let's see what we're looking at in this image. And really most of what I'm showing you in this image is what the brain looks like if we were to just open up the skull and remove it. And if we were to do that, we see this very, very tough uh, almost looks like plastic wrap or something. And this is the outer two meninges, the dura matter and the arachnoid matter. And we can see here uh, covering the entire brain, it's kind of been cut away here around the, the lower portions of the brain and the spine, but it really would extend around everything here. So when the brain first comes out, it's got those meninges around it that we can't really see too much. Although if we look closely, we can see this longitudinal fissure that divides uh, the cerebrum into left and right. And we can see a little bit of the spinal cord down here, but it's not a very good image. So we'll see it here shortly uh, after we remove these meninges and flip the brain over or cut the brain open. Now here on this side, again, we can see that dura mater and arachnoid mater covering the brain, but underneath there are some features that we can see. So right here, now this one has a hole in it because it looks like it's been poked with a needle, but this is the pituitary gland which is briefly mentioned in Bio-137, but is really important when you get to Bio-139 in the endocrine system. This is the pituitary gland. Now we can also see on this side and a part of one on this side, it would extend, but it's been cut. These are the optic nerves. These are the nerves that run to the eyeballs and convey uh, sensory information from the eyes to the brain. Now, it might be a little bit tough to tell here, but um, these actually cross over. And this point where they cross is called the optic chiasma. The optic chiasma. And chiasm is an X or a cross. So the point where the two optic nerves cross is the optic chiasma. We can also see the very ends of the olfactory nerves, which are uh, cranial nerve number one. The olfactory nerves are cranial nerve number one, and the ends of these cranial nerves actually is a little bit swollen, and we call this the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb is the swollen end of the olfactory nerve. And that's where most of the nerve endings, the sensory portions of these are. And this is what gives you your sense of smell. So just kind of interesting, now this is not something you need to know for lab, but it's interesting to kind of put things together. When you were studying the skull, there was that cribriform plate a part of the ethmoid bone. And the cribriform plate, if you look at it under a microscope, it's got these tiny little holes, uh, like little perforations. And these optic nerve and optic, uh, I'm sorry, olfactory nerve and olfactory bulbs sit on top of that cribriform plate. And these small little nerve endings that kind of look like hairs extend down through that cribriform plate. And when you inhale through your nose, particles in the air will attach to those nerve endings. And based on what particles they are and which nerve endings they attach to, it gives you different smells. 
So that's how your sense of smell works. Moving down a little lower, right here, now you can see there's a little bit of a dividing line. Let me see if I can highlight that for you a little bit. There's a little bit of a dividing line right here. And this structure is the pons. And just behind that is the medulla oblongata. And as the medulla oblongata ends about right here, everything from that point on would be the spinal cord. So medulla oblongata is inside the skull, but then as soon as we exit the skull, it is the spinal cord. And where do we exit the skull? Through the foramen magnum, or the magnum foramen. So now we've removed those outer two meninges, the dura mater and the arachnoid mater, and we're looking at the brain from above. This is a superior view of the brain. And what we can see now is the brain surface itself. So we can see quite a few more structures here. Here is that longitudinal fissure that divides the brain into left and right hemispheres or the cerebrum into left and right hemispheres. And we can make out the parietal lobe on each side of the brain. We can see a little bit of the frontal lobe on each side. We can't see the temporal lobe, but it would be just beneath this little outcropping right here on each side. And then right in back of the cerebrum, this is the occipital lobe. Now we have this very large space right here, and this structure is the cerebellum, the cerebellum. Now, it's not as easily divided into left and right the way the cerebrum is with this longitudinal fissure, but we still refer to the left and the right cerebellar hemispheres, but the whole structure is the cerebellum. And we can see protruding here the spinal cord. Now we can't see the pons and the medulla oblongata because the cerebellum is in the way. All right, now we get to the view that I mentioned in the beginning where there doesn't look like there's a lot going on here because it's all pretty much the same color, but in reality, there's a lot going on in this image. So pay very close attention. Hopefully you're watching on kind of a larger screen or have the ability to blow up your screen so that you can see what I'm pointing to in each area. So let's start with the bigger structures and then work our way to the smaller structures. This whole structure right here, this is that cerebrum that we were looking at earlier. What I did was cut along that longitudinal fissure and divided the whole brain into left and right halves. So this is a cerebral hemisphere. Back here we have a cerebellar hemisphere. And now we're looking at the brain in mid-sagittal section. Now up towards the front, this is the frontal lobe. Up here is the parietal lobe. And in the back is the occipital lobe. Now, moving to the interior of the cerebrum. First, there's kind of this very faint C-shaped area right here. Uh, let me outline it a little bit for you. I don't want to draw over it too much, but this kind of C-shaped area right here. That is the corpus callosum. Now that is what really connects the left and the right hemispheres and allows them to communicate with each other. And as a matter of fact, in some types of epilepsy, the corpus callosum seems to be having some issues. So corpus callosum begins with a C and it's kind of C-shaped. It's a little elongated in the sheep brain, not quite as much in the human brain, but that's how I kind of keep those straight. Corpus callosum, C-shaped. 
Now, just below the corpus callosum, there's something that you don't really need to know on this brain, but I want to point it out. You can see that this part of the brain is hollow. In lecture, if you talk about the brain very much, you'll talk about the ventricles of the brain, the hollow uh, cerebral spinal fluid filled areas. This is those the uh, ventricle area. Now there's different ventricles within the brain. We won't go into which ones are which, but that's what this open space is. Just below that, there's this kind of oval area right here. This is the thalamus, and this is essentially the relay center of the brain. As all of these different electrical signals, this information arrives at the brain or exits the brain, it will pass through the thalamus, which directs all of those signals to the appropriate spots. Just below the thalamus, this area right here, is called the hypothalamus. Remember, hypo means below, less than, under. So the hypothalamus is under the thalamus. Again, this is another one that's gonna be really important when you get to bio 139, the hypothalamus. Just underneath the hypothalamus, there are two structures. This structure right here, if we were able to flip this brain over, we would see that this is that optic chiasma. This is the point where those two optic nerves cross. This is the optic chiasma. Now just behind the optic chiasma and directly underneath the hypothalamus is the pituitary gland. And the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are constantly communicating with each other to control your endocrine system. Moving back a little bit, we can see this large structure right here, just underneath uh, kind of the back end of the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe. This structure right here is called the superior colliculus. And just underneath that, very difficult to make out right here, you can see this lighter area. It's not always lighter, it just happens to be in this brain, luckily. This is called the inferior colliculus. It's much smaller. The superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus. Now, here's where we're going to get into some tongue twisters. There is a left and a right superior colliculus. There is a left and a right inferior colliculus. So altogether, there are four colliculi. Left superior, left inferior, right superior, right inferior. All four of them together are called the corpora quadrigemina. Corpora quadrigemina. That literally translates into quadruplets. Corpora quadra means four body. Gemina means twin. So a twin with four bodies, quadruplets. So you could call this the superior colliculus of the corpora quadrigemina, the inferior colliculus of the corpora quadrigemina, but there's not really any need to. If we asked you what all of these together are called, corpora quadrigemina. If we ask you what this is called, it's the superior colliculus. No need to go beyond that. Now, just above the superior colliculus is a small structure that tends to be a little bit darker, not always, but it tends to be a little bit darker. That's called the pineal body. Now, the pineal body is, it seems to be kind of light sensitive and some people will call it the third eye, but really the pineal body, this is where melatonin is made, which regulates our sleep cycles, uh, kind of day-night differences, the pineal body. Going down a little bit lower, we see the superior colliculus. Now if we go kind of down and forward from that, this is the pons that we saw earlier. This is the medulla oblongata that we saw earlier. And then going off through the edge of the slide is the spinal cord. Pons, medulla oblongata, spinal cord. 
Now, unfortunately, I didn't get a very good picture right here, but this is that cerebellum that we were looking at earlier. And since it's cut in half, this would be the left cerebellar hemisphere. We're seeing the inside of the cerebellum. Now, the inside of the cerebellum has this weird feature. We can see this kind of lighter, almost white area that branches. This branching structure is called the arbor vitae, the arbor vitae. That means tree of life. The arbor vitae is the white area. The whole thing is the left cerebellar hemisphere. And if it were together, it would still be the cerebellum. Okay, so that's all the structures that you need to know on the real brain. There is another video that shows the human brain model and the brain stem model. So be sure to watch that if you haven't already, and I will talk to you soon.